do uh, 17 first. So the uh, exam would cover chapters 10, 11, and 17. Okay? So, um, so I'll just have to revise that. We can do that more or less in real time. Uh, this chapter is um, uh, not difficult, really. You actually know a whole lot of stuff that we're going to talk about. It's substitution, and then we're going to introduce elimination reactions, which is something we haven't really talked about. Um, but we've talked a lot about substitutions, etc. We're just going to go into more detail this time. All right. Um, we're dealing here with alkyl halides, and we've talked about this before. The uh, carbon halogen bond in an alkyl halide is polarized. And um, it's due to differences in electronegativity. The um, halogen is the negative pole, and the carbon down here is typically positive. Um, that's important in terms of substitution reactions, because what happens is um, something like a halogen anion, or um, something that's a Lewis base with electrons to donate, can interact with the positive thing here, and we can um, have a substitution reaction. <clears throat> um, a Lewis base like this is termed a nucleophile. The um, carbon down here would be called an electrophile. <clears throat> And basically what happens is the um, negative, uh, or the Lewis base here, the nucleophile, is simply attracted towards its carbon, and we can get substitution. Now we've seen um, examples of this substitution before. What simply happens here is we're going to move the halogen in, we're going to break the bond to our leaving group, and make a new product. Very simple reaction error. Here we just have the symmetrical chloride anion is nucleophile, is the electrophile. Break our bond to the leaving group, and we get our products. A very standard nucleophilic reaction. Now, when you look at the kinetics of this reaction, that is, how the rate of the reaction varies as you change concentration. Uh, you see that the rate depends upon both the concentration of nucleophile and electrophile. That means it's a bimolecular reaction, kinetically. This is a substitution reaction, and we use the phrase SN2 to describe it. It's a substitution, it's nucleophilic, and it's bimolecular. That's the two. A real example, if we take something like methoxide anion, um, that's a very good Lewis base, it's a good nucleophile, the oxyanion has lots of electrons. Here we have a bromoethane. The um, oxyanion can simply attack. This is our nucleophile. This is the electrophilic carbon. Bromine, we term our leaping. That's how we show the course of the reaction. Electrons move up, and the leaving group leaves. Product over here is the ether, um, and our group here, bromide, has gone. Um, again, this is the important nomenclature. Nucleophile down here, that's the guy with the electrons. Electrophile, that's the positive center. And of course, our leaving group. Any questions? Fairly simple concepts. Once again, this is second order kinetically. Both the nucleophile and the electrophile are in the rate limiting transition state. Now, there are actually two mechanisms that we can write for this. We've been showing um, the backside attack, but should be asking yourself, how do we know that? It's actually, we actually know it fairly well, but there are two 
possible mechanisms that you can write. <clears throat> One is a front side displacement. Instead of the nucleophile attacking the back of the carbon, in the front side mechanism, it's simply going to sneak in here, hit the carbon like that. Our transition state would look like this. Partial bonds to the electrophilic carbon, partial bond to our leaving group, overall in that negative charge. Um, and we would wind up with the same products. Once again, in the rate limiting transition state, we have the electrophile and the nucleophile. So this would also be on the left. So this is a viable mechanism. The backside mechanism, the one that we've talked about many times, um, involves <clears throat> the nucleophile attacking the back of the electrophilic carbon. Bond to the leaving group is broken. And our transition state simply looks like this. We have a planar carbon in the middle. Again, we have an amionic transition state. Here is the nucleophile. Here's the leaving group. Bonds are partially made, and of course, we wind up with the same product. Uh, distinguishing between these two, um, these days you can actually do calculations. Um, if you calculate for the front side attack, we can place our electrophilic carbon in the middle. Here we're doing a symmetrical displacement, roaming in, roaming out. And again, this is our transition state. If we go ahead and calculate charge distribution for this, we see that we have something that looks like this as electrostatic potential. Um, here's our uh, nucleophile. Here's our leaving group. Uh, these are slightly anionic. But you'll note that the carbon here actually bears quite a bit of the net negative charge of the transition state. Um, that's a little bit of an issue because halogen is much more um, electronegative. So it would like the electrons. If we do the same thing for the backside of displacement, our calculations look something like this. We have much more negative charge on the nucleophile and the leaving group, and actually a slight positive charge on our central carbon. Um, in terms of electronegativities, this is certainly a much better situation. The more electronegative atoms have the electrons, and carbon doesn't. Um, this is the electrostatic potential map. Shows it up very nicely. Here's our positive-ish carbon in the middle here, and the leaving group and the nucleophile. The real um, test for all of this, however, is the stereochemistry. If you look at the stereochemistry that you would predict for front side versus back side attack, they're going to be opposite predictions. Let's start off with a chiral center like this. If we do our priorities, Bromine is going to be highest priority, then the ethyl group and the methyl, and I have conveniently put the hydrogen to the back. This is a bromobutane, so this would be 1, 2, 3 as clockwise. This is R to bromobutane. Now, if we allow this to attack, That is, our halogen attacks from the bottom, bromine leaves from the top, we would wind up with this chiral center. Remember, in the SO2 transition state, this um, goes planar. So we're simply moving this up, bromine leaves, and this is our product. If we do our priorities here, chlorine is first, then the ethyl, then the methyl. This is going this way, and that is S configuration. The prediction very simply is that if we have 
backside displacement, we should have inversion of stereochemical configuration. Everyone see that? In both cases, the halogens are the highest priority. So we have gone from R to S, and again, we have inversion of stereochemical configuration. Now, in our two mechanisms, our backside displacement with a planar transition state, we get inversion, that's our prediction. With our front side displacement, this comes in, this bounces out, there is no change in the configuration around uh, the electrophilic carbon. So front side attack would give us retention of configuration, back side would give us inversion. The observation is that SN2 reactions with a chiral center do in fact give us inversion. Therefore, we have really strong evidence that this is, in fact, a backside displacement. Now, we've seen this little movie many, many times. <clears throat> Again, it shows the transition state very nicely. Nice and planar here in the middle. And you can see the configuration here inverting as it goes through the backside displacement. How would, we, how would you have it set up on the exam? Like, would you have, like, say, the chlorine coming up from behind, or, like, you'll show? Mm -hmm. um, on a typical exam question on this subject is actually probably going to deal with the stereochemistry. Um, I would give you something, you know, a nucleophile comes in, asks you to draw the product with the proper stereochemistry. Now, this transition state, once again, this is the rate limiting transition state. Everybody's in there, and that makes it bimolecular. If we represent this using a reaction coordinate, it's very simple. We start off with our reactants. Here's our products, our transition state. This is planar. Both the nucleophile and the electrophile are in there, so this is truly bimolecular. Any questions? All right, so what we know about an SN2 reaction. Kinetically, the race proportional to the concentration of both reactants. That makes it bimolecular. The stereochemistry here proceeds with inversion of configuration, and we use the word inserted to represent this type of reaction where everything is in the transition state, uh, bonds are making and breaking at the same time. The word for that is concerted. Any questions? Now, substitution reactions themselves are actually remarkably simple. If you are given a substitution problem, really all you have to do is make a bond to your um, electrophile, so your nucleophile attacks, make your bond, and the ligand group leaves. That's all you have to remember to do. You also, if it's um, appropriate, you need to invert the configuration. Let's just do a quick set. Uh, something about this room it must be interference or something in here because in other rooms it works fine. Uh, go ahead and just very quickly use these nucleophiles, uh, use this generic electrophile, and go ahead and just jot down the products.
nucleophile is hydroxide anion. We're going to attack through the oxygen. The bromine is our leaving group. All we have to do is make a bond from the oxygen to the carbon. Our bromine is gone. And we have made a simple alcohol. <clears throat> Just like hydroxide, we can also use alkoxide, whether well, that's an alkyl or aryl group of some sort. Um, as our nucleophile, again, the bond is from the oxygen to the carbon. And we have made an ether in this case. This is the example we've been doing over and over again, where this is halogen is a nucleophile, halogen is a leaving group. We simply make <coughs> the other alkyl halide. And finally, um, here I have used a carboxylate anion as our nucleophile. Um, this isn't a great reaction where, um, well, somebody's going to talk about this in 235. But the um, uh, oxyanion simply attacks the electrophilic center, bromine leaves, and we have made an ester. There are nicer ways to make esters. Fischer serification is the classic. Um, but again, this method can work depending upon what you're dealing with. Now, why does that go uh, Well, remember the carboxylate <coughs> anion. This is a carbonyl. And this is just the anionic oxygen. That's a nucleophile and our leaving group. Another example that we've looked at before is using alkyne anion as a nucleophile. Now, when we talked about alkynes back in chapter 9, we pointed out that this was an acidic carbon. Now, by acidic, we, or carbon CH, um, we're talking about a pKa of about 19 or so. So it's, you know, not the typical acid that we're using. But in terms of carbon acids, it's pretty good. This is sodium amide. Um, you make it by previously dissolving sodium in liquid ammonia. Um, remember, if you added all of this together, we would get partial reduction, wouldn't we? But so you make this first. This is just a very, very strong base in H2 minus, and this converts it very nicely into alkyne anion. Alkyne anion is a fairly decent nucleophile. It can attack an electrophilic carbon, leaving group leaves, and we have simply taken our alkyne and lengthened our chain. Very, very simple reaction. <clears throat> Once again, our transition state, we have a planar carbon in the middle. As this thing is attached, you'll see we go planar. Bond of the leaving group is breaking. And we get inversion in our sinful carbon. This is actually a fairly decent reaction. In addition to oxyanions and halogens and um, this, we can also do substitution reactions very successfully using nitrogen nucleophiles. <clears throat> um, this is azide anion, and these will be um, various amines, starting with ammonia itself. Go ahead and take this and just jot down the products that you would get from these reactions.
Remember, there are a couple ways we can draw azide anion. In something like this, you really don't need to draw it out. Just remember that the one of the terminal nitrogens is our nucleophile. In this case, we would simply do our displacement. The azide winds up bonded directly to the carbon. This is an alkyl azide. Um, probably not something you want to do at home because the azide group itself, um, alkyl azides especially, are very, very explosive compounds, very unstable. If a nitrogen of ammonia attacks, um, nitrogen with its lone pair, very nice nucleophile, will simply hit the electrophilic carbon, the leaving group will leave, and we will make the initial product would be the ammonium cation. Now that's because we have three bonds on our nitrogen here, now we have four. That makes the thing positive, right? In reality, as soon as you form this, given the reaction conditions, this is going to lose a proton and form the new cholamine. On an exam, you could either write the initially formed ammonium compound or the new cholamine. Either one would be acceptable. If our nucleophile here is a secondary amine, we would form this ammonium compound. Again, we have two methyls and a hydrogen. This can also lose its hydrogen to form the neutral tertiary amine. This is a primary amine because it's attached to one carbon. This would be attached to one, two, three carbons. And finally, down here, if we have a tertiary amine as our nucleophile, we would form a quaternary ammonium salt. This has no proton to lose, so it is stuck being forever cation. All of these are very good reactions. Again, amines are very nice nucleophiles. Any questions? Now you notice that as we have done all of these examples, we have used a generic primary alkyl halide. And that's because, frankly, SN2 reactions work fairly nicely with a primary alkyl halide. If you get to something that is other than a primary alkyl halide, they don't work quite so well. If we go all the way to a tertiary center, so let's skip secondary for now, we see that the whole course of the reaction is totally different. With a tertiary alkyl halide, if you do the kinetics, the rate of the reaction is only dependent upon the concentration of the electrophilic group. So, in this case, that would be the tertiary alkyl halide. Doesn't matter how much nucleophile you have in there, it makes no difference to the weight. Okay, totally different than we saw with primary. If you look at a chiral electrophile, instead of having inversion of configuration, we get racemization. Racemization means you get equal concentration of both enantiomers. Finally, if we have a tertiary alkyl halide, this can undergo a skeletal rearrangement. Yeah, we'll talk about some examples of that in a minute. But what that means is clearly we have a totally different mechanism here for tertiary halides than we did for primary. This is going to be called the SN1 reaction. <clears throat> the um, racemization, <clears throat> this is a tertiary alkyl halide, and I've drawn this with our configuration. Methyl group is the lowest, and it's in the back. 
This is our electrophile. If we did an SN, a true SN2 reaction, we would expect to get inversion of our configuration. Again, uh, bromine is going to leave, oxygen is there. And we would get the S 3 methoxy 3 methyl hexane. So that would, that's what we would expect. In fact, if you do this reaction, you do get this stuff, but you also get an equal concentration of this enantiomer, which is the R enantiomer. <clears throat> the same mixture, we get equal concentrations of both. So once again, very clearly, this is not an SN2 reaction. What's happening here is we are taking our chiral um, electrophile and we are generating an intermediate carbon cation. Now remember, carbon cation is planar. This is an sp2 center. And because it's planar, our nucleophile can now come in from top or the bottom, if it comes in this way, it would give us one enantiomer. If it comes in this way, it would give us the opposite. So what's consistent with this observation is that we, in fact, have an intermediate carbocation. Methoxide attached to the top. We would get this enantiomer as S. If methoxide attacks from the bottom, we get the opposite enantiomer, and that's all. So the suggestion that this reaction involves a planar carbocation clearly explains the stereochemistry that we observe. Any questions on that? So the role of an intermediate marble cation also would explain the kinetics. <clears throat> the slow step in a reaction like this, which is going to be your rate limiting step, is only going to involve your tertiary halide. What happens in our slow step is that all by itself, this halogen just decides to pack up and leave. As it does, it's going to form the carbocation. This is a slow process. The only thing that's in the rate limiting transition state is the electrophile. <clears throat> the second step of the reaction where methoxide attacks, this is going to be very, very fast. Slow step, define your kinetics. Doesn't matter how much of this you have, because this is always going to be very, very fast. So the suggestion of a carbocation is consistent with both the kinetics and with the stereochemistry. Any questions? If we show this guy on a reaction profile, oh, we call this then an SN1 reaction. Again, it's substitution. It's nucleophilic, but it's only unimolecular. Only one thing in our slow rate limiting step. The reaction coordinate looks like this. Here we start off. Slow step is simply breaking this bond to give the carbocation. So this is our rate limiting transition state. We're down to our carbocation, and then this is the fast step. Only one reactant, that's this guy, is in the rate limiting transition state. Therefore, this is unimolecular. A 
let's go ahead and look at a movie that shows the same thing. Hopefully. <clears throat> Here we're going to have a tertiary alkyl halide. What's going to happen is that in our slow step, we're going to form the carbon cation. Um, this is solvolysis, so water is going to be our nucleophile. This guy will lose a proton quickly to get the alcohol. You actually did this reaction. See if our movie will run. There it goes. Step one, we're going to spontaneously break the bond of our leaving groups. That's our transition state, and that's the only thing in there. Here's our carbon cation. We can attack from the top or from the bottom. Water is our nucleophile, so it comes in. It'll lose this proton. And this is our product, the alcohol. Any questions? All right, let's just review what we know about carbocations again, because they're obviously important in these types of reactions. <clears throat> we said that carbocations were planar. So this is from the top. These are 120 degree bond angles. Um, this is our carbocation here. Again, we have empty p orbitals, top and bottom, and this is a trigonal carbon. Truly an sp squared carbon. <clears throat> because of that, we can get attacked from either side into either end of this orbital, and that gives us our product. Carbocation stability. Why do we only see this type of reaction with tertiary halides? Because tertiary carbocations are relatively stable. Primary and methyl carbocations are very unstable. <clears throat> um, alkyl groups are electron releasing through something called hyperconjugation. Um, you'll talk a little bit about that in 235. If you look at the electrostatic potential maps, here we have a fairly delocalized positive center. With our secondary carbocation, it's much more intense. And with our primary, we have a big honk and blue spot. <coughs> the more you can disperse the charge, the more stable it is. Therefore, <clears throat> tertiaries are much more stable than secondaries, and of course, more stable than primaries. Any questions? We've talked about carbocations before, so we should be happy with that. As always, resonance stabilized carbocations are the most stable. Um, here's our friend, the benzyl carbocation. Again, we can delocalize this charge into the uh, ring. This is, remember, we call this the ortho position. This is the para position. And we can delocalize again to the other ortho positions. Because we have um, delocalization everywhere, um, this is a very stable carbocation. Again, um, benzyl is always better. Any questions? All right, let's go ahead and just do a simple reaction. Um, what I tend to do on an exam um, over something like this is I will give you a simple reaction, ask you to draw the intermediate carbocation, 
um, and then the final product for the reaction. So let's go ahead and do that. Now this, of course, is not a chiral center. That's a methyl group, that's a methyl group, there's an ethyl. <clears throat> What's going to happen in our initial rate limiting step is we're going to break the bond to our leaving group. That's going to be the slow step. So our carbocation is simply going to look like this. It will be planar. Have two methyls and an ethyl. So that is our intermediate carbocation. The last step in the reaction is simply going to be our nucleophile. In this case, it's going to be methoxide. It's going to attack the carbocation. This is our fast step. And again, we're going to make the heat. Remember, because we have the planar carbocation, that if we have um, racemization if we have stereochemistry. So, um, because methoxide can easily attack, as you see, from either side. Any questions? All right, go ahead and do the same thing again. Show me the intermediate carbocation and the final product. Well, this is pretty simple. To make our carbocation, all we would have to do would be to break the bond, and that's going to give us a carbocation on our secondary carbon. We would, therefore, simply write something like this as our final product. However, this is wrong. If you do this reaction, this is not the product you get. This is. So this is an example of what we saw, what we said earlier, a rearrangement. We would expect to get the secondary ether. In fact, we get the tertiary ether. Now, the rearrangement that's happening goes something like this. Initially, we are going to form our secondary carbocation. However, the secondary carbocation lives in a molecule that has a tertiary center. And it knows, deep in its heart, that if it could place the positive charge on the tertiary center, it would be much more safe. So in a case like this, what happens is the hydride, the hydrogen with its electrons, is simply transferred over from the tertiary center to the secondary. It's between adjacent carbons, so we call that a 1-2 hydride transfer. And we have now made our tertiary carbocation. The final product, the fast step, methoxide simply attacks the tertiary center to give us the observed product. 
Oh, on an exam, this would, the question for this would be slightly different. It would say, draw the initially formed carbocation. So that's this guy. The most stable carbocation following rearrangement. That would be this one. And then the final product, which is this. So, if your molecule cannot undergo a rearrangement to give a more stable carbocation, just draw the initial thing and make your product. If we can undergo an internal rearrangement, it will happen, and we would, in this case, get the tertiary ether. Now, remember the hydride transfer here is not magic. This is a very simple little movie. If we have a carbocation here, this is the primary center. This would be a secondary center. Um, transfer of this hydride would look something like this. Simply going to slide over from here to here to make our secondary carbocation. So it's not magic. Hydrogen with its electrons are simply sliding over from one center to the other. Now hydride transfers <coughs> um, happen fairly easily because hydrogen has a very low mass. You can actually get skeletal rearrangements that involve alkyl chains. Um, but they're slower because, again, they're much more massive and the energy required to do the, re re the rearrangement is um, it's higher. But hydride transfers work very nicely. Let's go ahead and look at a real example. <coughs> Here we have, again, um, this is a secondary center. Now, remember we've talked about tertiary and we talked about primary. Secondary was kind of left out here. That's because secondary can go either way. Um, if I give you something involving a secondary center, I will very clearly indicate which mechanism I want. So, for this SN1 reaction, Go ahead and draw the structure of the initially formed carbocation, the most stable carbocation following rearrangement, and the final product. initially formed carbocation, all we're going to do is break the bond from the carbon to the bromine, and we will form the secondary carbocation. There we go. Our secondary carbocation is not the most stable carbocation that can be formed here because the secondary is living right next door to a benzyl position, isn't it? And we know that the benzyl carbocation would be much more stable. So this is our initially formed carbocation. That's box number one on the exam. The most stable carbocation we're going to transfer the hydride from the benzyl center to the secondary. <coughs> and our product here is our benzyl carbocation. So initially formed carbocation, 
most stable carbocation following rearrangement. And then our final product, methoxide simply adds to the carbocation to give our benzylic ether. Any questions? All right, on the exam, you get the same thing here. You're asked to draw the initially formed carbocation, the most stable carbocation following rearrangement, and the final product. Once again, because it's secondary, I tell you clearly, it's an SN1 reaction. This box is really easy. Make our initially formed carbocation. We simply have to break the bond to our leaving group. And this is going to form our secondary carbocation. Now we don't have um, a methyl group I'm sorry, a hydrogen that we can do a 1,2 hydride transfer with. So in a case like this, we're going to do the best we can, and that is take our methyl group and do a transfer with it. This is a quaternary center, isn't it? Bonded to four carbons. In a case like this, this entire methyl group with its pair of electrons simply slides, just like the hydride did, from here to here. So it's a 1,2 methyl shift, we call it. 1,2 methyl shift. We're just going to take again the methyl with its electrons. We're going to move it to there. And this is our tertiary Finally, to get our product, our nucleophile is going to attack the tertiary carbocation. Again, we just slid our methyl group up here. Here's our positive center. Nucleophilic attack. And we wind up with the tertiary ether. Classic example of a skeletal rearrangement. Any questions? All right, well, let's go ahead and just review what we know. For us in two reactions, if you have a reaction with a primary alkyl halide, and this is a simple substitution, all you have to do is substitute the nucleophile for the leaving group and invert the configuration if appropriate. That's real simple. Take the nucleophile, stick it on, leaving group is gone. If it's a chiral center, invert it. That's an SN2 reaction. For an SN1 reaction, you're going to remove your leaving group. You're going to form a copper cation. You're going to rearrange that if necessary to give the most stable carbon cation. Again, add your nucleophile. And remember, we get racemization of our stereo. Nucleophile attacks, leaving group leaves, and we get substitution. SN1, that's going to happen with 
um, tertiary centers, SN2 with primary centers. If you have a secondary center, for sure I will tell you if I want SN1 or SN2. Go ahead and do these simple um, SN2 reactions. And our first one, we have a benzyl halide. Um, a nucleophile is simply methoxide anion. All in the world what happens is the oxy anion will attack, the bromine will leave, and we will make the benzylic ether. This is called phenoxide. <clears throat> Phenol is an OH. Um, we will talk about those um, in chapter 17. Um, again, just regard this as an oxyanion, just like methoxide. This is going to attack our primary center here. Halogen will leave, and we will just make the ether. Here's the bond that we just made. There's our CH2 right here. And then once again here, we have a carboxylate anion as our nucleophile. You know it's an SN2 reaction, so the oxyanion will simply displace the primary halide We'll get a bond from the oxygen to our CH2 here, and we will make an alkyne that's also a carboxylate ester. questions on these concepts. They're not that difficult, really. <clears throat> now this chapter also goes into great detail, talking about how you can control whether a reaction generates <clears throat> or follows an SN2 versus an SN1 mechanism. Chemists, it turns out, are clever enough that we can actually control that. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go through these, but bottom line at the end, it's going to seem very simple. So let's go ahead and just look at the effects. We're going to see the substrate effect. Now, we've already talked about that. Primary, SN2, tertiary, SN1. Secondary is a real issue. The nucleophile. We'll see that by choosing our nucleophile, we can force a reaction towards SN2 or SN1. The nature of our leaving group also matters. And most importantly here is going to be this last one, the solvent. Turned out that there's a really neat trick we can do with solvents that will push either SN1 or SN2. <clears throat> Once again, reactivity. This is our substrate effect. We know this. Tertiary 
going to be SN1, so least reactive is SN2. Primary, most reactive in SN2, and very, very poor for SN1. These guys are in the middle, and again, <coughs> they're uh, not quite so good. The reason for this, for the selection, you can argue is a couple uh, different reasons. Um, if we had a tertiary center and we tried to do an SN2 reaction, we have three alkyl groups hanging out here around our leaving group with a, something simple like bromomethane. All we have are hydrogens. There's a huge difference in the steric bulk associated with these guys. In order for the SN2 reaction to occur, our nucleophile would have to somehow navigate between all these methyl groups to find this carbon. Over here, we have just a carbon <coughs> uh, with hydrogens on it, no steric clouding, no problem getting in. If we look at molecular models, this is even more obvious. There we go. Again, the carbon that we want to get to, I've colored purple so it's easy to see. <clears throat> Here's our leaving group. Our nucleophile would have to somehow get in past all these methyl groups and find that little patch in order to do the reaction. Over here we have a nice big target, no steric crowding, and no problem. If we did manage to squeeze a nucleophile in here, this is what our SN2 transition state would look like. Again, here's our incoming group, here's our leaving group. This is a tertiary center, this is a methyl group. This is what it would look like in a space filling model. You can do this calculation and then you can actually uh, measure the charges on our groups. For our tertiary center, our distance here is about 2.9 angstroms over here we're about 2.4. So <clears throat> because of our big bulk from our methyl groups, the leaving group and the nucleophile are fairly far apart. In terms of charges, <clears throat> this is the electrostatic potential map. You'll see there's much more positive charge on the carbon than there is here. Our incoming and leaving groups have about minus 0.88, and over here we're about 0.69. So this is a bad transition state because we have charge separation, positive here, negatives out here. We have increased distance. Um, that's why primary just work so much better. Plus just a steric bulk of trying to get to that carbon, that makes it bad. All right, the next thing that we can control here is our nucleophile. Now remember, we want to have something that, that's a good Lewis base. It has electrons it wants to donate to something. Very, very simply, if we have a very basic nucleophile, we can expect good SN2 reactions. If we're down here with a very poor nucleophile, um, we're going to have four SN2 reactions. So if we're dealing here with, say, a secondary center, and you really wanted SN2, you would want a good nucleophile, um, something like this at the top end of the pH scale. 
We also have a selection due to polarizability. Turns out that iodine is a very, very good nucleophile. Uh, fluoride is a very, very poor nucleophile. As you go down a period in the periodic table, or down a group, I'm sorry, in the periodic table, the nucleophilicity increases. That's because these guys have big, squishy electron clouds. Very polarizable. They can get in there and they can do reactions. Up here at the top of the uh, periodic table, we have uh, electrons held closely and they're just not quite as good. Sulfur is much, much better than oxygen, and again, iodide is much, much better than fluorine or fluorine. So that's just a simple periodic table effect. Leaving group. <clears throat> this is gonna be just the opposite of what we saw for nucleophiles. Remember, for a nucleophile, we said if it was a strong base, that was good. Over here, a strong base for a leaving group is really rotten. Halogen is in here somewhere. Um, in general, the weaker the base, the better the leaving group. Now, this is called tosylate. It's the anion of uh, paratoluene sulfonic acid. Uh, you don't know what that is yet, but uh, this is a very, very strong acid, so it's a weak base. It's the equivalent of sulfuric acid, but it's a very, very weak base and a darn good weak. So if you want to do an SN2 reaction, your nucleophile should be a strong base, and your leaving group should be a weak. This is toluene sulfonic acid. Again, it is the organic equivalent of a sulfuric acid, forms the toluene sulfonate anion, pKa of about minus five. Very strong acid, that means that this is a very weak base. Wonderful leaving group. Tosylates are used as leaving groups all the time in organic. Methanol, methoxide, pKa of 16 versus minus 5. This would be a lousy, lousy region. Finally, the real magic here to control SN1 versus SN2 turns out to be the solvent. Think about it. You're doing an SN1 reaction. You're going to make ions, aren't you? Something has to grab this leaving group and make it go. Just like dissolving a salt in water, if you have a really polar solvent, that's going to happen. Polar solvent is going to favor SN1. And these guys are called magic solvents. And they favor SN2. The magic solvents are grouped as polar aprotic solvents. DMSO, DMF, this is acetonitrile, um, HMPA. Uh, these guys really, really promote SN2 reactions. They inhibit ionization and um, will very, very strongly. Um, if you see a substitution reaction and you're using either DMSO or DMF, you should know right away that this is going to be um, an SN2 reaction. This is DMSO, um, <clears throat> sulfur, oxygen. Well, this could be a double bond or a single bond. Um, partial negative, partial positive. That's a polar aprotic solvent. Again, 
very, very good at, at dissolving things and at promoting essence of magic solvents. So, if you want an SN2, you want primary, you want a strong nucleophile, you want a low pKa leaving group, and a magic solvent. If you want SN1 reaction, you want tertiary center. You want a weak nucleophile because you want to just give it time for it to break. And you want a polar solvent, something that's going to support ions. Now again, on an exam, I will typically tell you if you're dealing with a secondary center, if I want SN1 or SN2. <clears throat> you should realize if we have a primary center, you're going to do SN2. If you have a tertiary center, you're thinking SN1. Questions that I sometimes ask are about the magic solvents. <clears throat> if you wanted an SN2 reaction to occur, would you use DMSO or water? Okay, very simple. Uh, just make sure you understand the general. Any questions? All right. So, just when you think it's safe to design a substitution reaction, Take a nice tertiary center, take a nice um, strong nucleophile. You expect to get the tertiary right? Well, it turns out that it's not quite that simple after all. Because you also get formation of alkenes. All right. So what's happening here is termed an elimination reaction. Not too difficult to conceive, actually. Here we have our methoxide, our nucleophile. And here we have our tertiary alkyl halide. We have methyl groups with hydrogens all the way around. And remember, under SN1 conditions, this bromine is going to leave and form a carbocation. Instead of that, methoxide can simply act as a base. Instead of this bromine having to wait to leave, this can simply pluck off the proton. The electrons can move in form a carbon-carbon double bond, leaving group leaves, and we would wind up with this as our product. This is elimination. We have lost the elements of HBr. We have eliminated HBr from our molecule and made an alkene. Now this reaction that I've drawn here has a mechanism that is concerted. By concerted, remember what we said, we're removing the hydrogen, making our double bond, and our leaving group is leaving all at the same time. So we're all in the transition state together. That means the kinetics here are going to be second order again. 
The rate's going to depend upon methyl oxide concentration, and it's going to depend upon the concentration of the tertiary alloy. This is an elimination reaction. So we're going to call it an E2. Elimination, second order. Let's go ahead and look at the E2 reaction a little bit more closely here. Here I have um, a compound, two methyl groups. These are both chiral centers, aren't they? Here's our leaving group. I'm going to stick a base in there. This base is going to turn out to be the magic base for E2 eliminations. This is tert-butoxide. If we have an OH here, that would be tertiary butanol, tert-butanol. Turns out that tert-butanol really favors elimination by an E2 mechanism. All right, let's go ahead and look at this guy. And we're going to look at the mechanism. If we actually do this, we wind up with only one particular isomer. Again, we have methyl groups here and here. The hydrogen, the only product that we make is our cis isomer. Okay. Because we only make the cis isomer, we can tell exactly what's happening with the stereochemistry of our E2 elimination. So let's look at that. Here I've taken my compound. Now, let's see, let's go back. Methyl groups are on the same side. Hydrogen's on this side. Bromine would be going back. And the uh, benzene ring is also going back. So what I've done, methyl groups are on the same side, hydrogen same side. I've just put these two um, sticking out to make it easy. What I want to do is rotate around this bond so that the bromine and the hydrogen are going to be on opposite sides. So I'm going to take and rotate this bond just 60 degrees. When I do that, again, we have, let's go back, we're going to put the hydrogen down, middle group's going to be here, methyl group here. Hydrogen down, phenyl, and methyl. Now, if methoxide comes in and removes this hydrogen, our double bond is going to form here. Our leaving group is going to leave, and we wind up with the cis F isomer. This type of elimination is referred to as a trans elimination. More correctly, it's called anti or anterofacial. They're at opposite bases. Also notice that the hydrogen and the leaving group that leave are in the same plane. Come on. There's our plane. <clears throat> so this elimination, the hydrogen and the leaving group must be coplanar and trans. Pull this off, pull this off. See the methyl groups are on the same side here. And we get our cis product. If instead <clears throat> we rotate this so the hydrogen and this are on the same side, 
So I'm going to rotate this way, fiddle down, hydrogen up, fiddle down, hydrogen up. If terbutoxide pulls off this hydrogen, and we form our double bond, our methyls would be on opposite sides, and they would give us a trans product. This would be a sin or superficial elimination, but we know that this only gives the cis isomer. So the sin or superficial is not observed, only the trans elimination. Important things to remember. Hydrogen in the leaving group must be trans to each other and they must be in the same plane. Let's look at a movie. <clears throat> Here we have a leaving group. Here we have a hydrogen. And we're going to simply do an E2 elimination. We're going to send our base in this way. As it does, there's a transition state. This and this are in the same plane. And there's our alkene. Must be in the same plane. And they must be anterofacial or anti to each other. Kinetically, we said all these things are in the same transition state. So it looks like this. And this is our simple inserted E2 elimination. Now, if we have E2, Oh, well, let's go ahead and do some problems first. Here, take this stuff. Here's our base. Do a need to elimination. Remember, the hydrogen that you extract and the leaving group must be coplanar. Well, it turns out that that's not so difficult here, is it? <clears throat> here we have a hydrogen. Here we have our leaving group. They are both in the same plane. Uh, and they are trans to each other. So our base can come in. Pulls the hydrogen off. And this is the alkene that we make. Make sense? Hydrogen and the leaving group are trans and coplanar. But is this the only product that you could get? No, because this carbon out here also has two hydrogens, doesn't it? One's going to be pointing up, one's going to be pointing down. We could easily do the elimination this way. That is, pull this hydrogen off, bromine would leave, and we would get this alkene. Now it turns out that <clears throat> this one is not observed. This is the product of the elimination. Very minor product here. And this is what's known as Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev's rule simply says 
that if you're going to do an E2 elimination, and it makes a difference, the most highly substituted alkene will be formed. If you look at this, this alkene has three carbons attached to it. This guy has two carbons. This is the most highly substituted alkene. Sitesteps rule says that's the one that we form. Any questions? Now, not surprisingly, if there's something called an E2, there must also be an E1, right? Sometimes, if you take a tertiary alkyl halide and a nice nucleophile, and you're going to do your elimination reaction, you, under certain conditions, you can form the alkene, but the mechanism of the reaction is different because it's unimolecular, not bimolecular. What's happening here if you did this in a polar solvent? In a polar solvent, what's going to happen? We're going to promote ionization, aren't we? That's going to be our slow step. And that's going to make this reaction unimolecular or E1. So for an E2 elimination, you don't want a polar solvent. For an E2 elimination, you want what we'll see for butanol is the choice. But here, if we take a polar solvent like alcohol, a methanol, this would follow an E1 mechanism. Now, the E1 mechanism we've seen before, all that happens is we take and we ionize polar solvent, promotes that. We get our carbocation. But instead of our nucleophile adding to give us an SN1, we simply pull off the hydrogen out here and make our alkene. Now, just like SN1 reactions, if you can do a rearrangement, it'll happen. Carbocations generate rearrangements. That makes a mess of it, but interesting. Our mechanism for this looks exactly like we had for SN1. Our slow step is the formation of the carbocation and then pulling off the proton to give the alkene is fast. <clears throat> this is a classic E1 mechanism. The requisite movie. Here's our terpenal chloride. In our slow step, we're going to break the bond to the leaving group. make our intermediate carbocation, and then finally, a base is going to come in, yank off a hydrogen instead of attacking, to give us our alkene. All right. Just like trying to control substitution, unimolecular substitution, bimolecular, you can also control the tendency of a reaction to go SN2 or E2. The bottom line, the, the thing that's really going to work is going to be the size of your nucleophile. If we have terbutoxide, these things, it's like a basketball with an O minus on it. 
This is very, very bulky, bad nucleophile, doesn't get in there, good base, you're going to get E2. Little tiny thing down here like methoxide can squeeze in there and it can make um, an SN2 reaction happen. <clears throat> Again, here's our little tiny guy getting in to do the substitution. That's virtually 100%. If instead of methoxide, we use terbutoxide, again, tertiary alcohol, this is going to pull off the hydrogen and give us elimination virtually 100%. The difference, again, is simply steric bulk. Easy to get to, big ugly thing, not easy to get to. Our base strength, <coughs> again, good strong base because we have to pull off the hydrogen. Uh, weak base, almost always going to go SN2. The bottom line here, though, is that if you ever see terbutoxide and terbutanol, you're talking E2. All right, this is what we've done so far. SN2 reactions, primary, strong nucleophile, good leaving group, nonpolar, or a magic solvent. E2, we want terbutoxide, period. These guys, we want a polar solvent and something that's going to be a stable carbon cation. Can you control between <clears throat> SN1 and E1? Not very well. Not very well. All right, on the exam, what's it look like? Well, it looks like this. This is terbutoxide terbutanol. <clears throat> When you see this, and it's an alkyl halide or a tosylate leaving group, that should scream at you, I am doing an E2 elimination. These are very simple E2 eliminations, aren't they? <clears throat> Here's our leaving group, the halogen. We're going to pull off a hydrogen from our benzoic carbon here. Again, this is going to be E2. We're going to get a double bond through here. We've simply made styrene. There it is. Tosylate, OTS, again, that's toluene sulfonic acid. Whenever you see that, that should scream at you. I am a good leaving group. Okay? Terbutoxide is going to pull a hydrogen off of one of these methyl groups. Tosylate is going to leave. And we will simply make the alkene. Well, those guys are simple. <clears throat> they um, clearly, you never see these on the exam, too easy. This one, however, does make the exam. Remember what you know <clears throat> about an E2 elimination. The hydrogen and the leaving group must be coplanar and trans, right? In this, 
we would dearly like to make our double bond here and follow Sicef's rule, wouldn't we? But instead, this is the product that we get. So this is the anti sicefs product, if you will. We have anti Montanikov, why not, right? Why does this form? Look at this guy. <clears throat> Here's our leaving group. It's equatorial, right? In order for this to leave at all, it's going to have to be in an axial position. Because what's trans to this guy? This bond. That's a carbon-carbon bond. That doesn't work, right? What's trans in coplanar here? This guy. Therefore, we're going to do a ring inversion here. Now I put my bromine axial. It's not happy there, but OK, I put it there anyway. Now, <clears throat> what is transit coplanar with it? Here's bromine. Our methyl is. Hydrogen is not. Only this hydrogen is axial, coplanar, and trans. Therefore, this guy is the one that's removed. Terbutoxide simply pulls off the hydrogen. Bromine leaves, and we make this alkene. Now, you should have known this right away, because you look here and you say, bromine is equatorial, right? This hydrogen you want to pull off is axial. They're cis to each other, aren't they? Can't do that. The only hydrogen that's going to be trans is going to be another equatorial, and that's this guy. So we make it axial, do the elimination, and get the anti sitesep product. Any question? All right, let's wind it up with a simple synthesis. <clears throat> In lab, we're actually going to make cyclohexene as our last lab. <clears throat> Here, I want you to start with cyclohexene and make 1,3-cyclohexadiene. Now this is going to be a two-step synthesis. This means that you're getting to be big boys and girls, okay? When you do a two-step synthesis, you want to look at your final product. <clears throat> you can peek at the starting material, but don't tell anyone you did. You only want to look at your final product and ask yourself, well, what is it? Well, we're making an alkene. It's a diene. <clears throat> we know how to make alkenes only one way, and that is through an elimination reaction, right? So we peek at our starting material. This double bond is already here. So this double bond we just made. We made that through an elimination. That's the only way we know to make it. So that means we must have had a leaving group attached here. What we did is simply roll in sodium oxide, pulled off our hydrogen, and made our double bond. Therefore, what we want for a leaving group A 
tertiary toxide and butanol, that's our reaction conditions. Our leaving group here, let's just do a bromine. That'll work. So now you sit back and you say to yourself, my gosh, I did it. If I had three bromocyclohexene, I could throw in terbutoxide and make the diet. Right? <clears throat> Your second problem now is how do you convert cyclohexene into three bromo cyclohexene? So this was one synthesis problem. Here's your second. All right. <clears throat> this is an alkyl halide, isn't it? But where is the halogen attached? It's attached adjacent to a double bond. That makes it allylic, doesn't it? So what you say to yourself is, my gosh, this is an allylic bromide. How many ways do I know to make allylic halides? One. Only one. And that is free radical bromination of an alkene. We are starting with an alkene. <coughs> All we want to do is allylic bromination. Something like and bromocyclinamide will work fine. And bromocyclinamide, shine a light on it, make a allylic radical that picks up the bromine radical and makes three bromocyclohexene. Once you have this, you simply do an elimination and we have our diene. By the time you finish 235, Sadly, without me, um, two-step syntheses will be very common. 